Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's been a long while since we worship together. As we continue to stay at home, we're thankful that God is on my presence. God is with me here at home and also with all of you at home. So we can worship God together in one spirit. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is once again raising its ugly head and lurking at the door. Here are some of the recent AP News headlines. Quote, new report finds anti-Semitism on the rise in Czech Republic. Quote, anti-defamation league. Anti-Semitism remains a problem in Massachusetts. Quote, Israeli president, Germany must win anti-Semitic fight. Attorney General Barr, there will be zero tolerance on anti-Semitism. Pope, populism is fertile ground to foment anti-Semitism. Fresh anti-Semitic writings appear in Italian cities and towns. These are just few of the many news reports I found just in the first half of this year, 2020. See, anti-Semitism is not new. It has happened throughout world history. The Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, and the Catholic Church who branded the Jews as Christ's killers. Even the great reformer, Martin Luther, was considered anti-Semitic in his writings. Within the 20th century, Hitler exterminated six million Jews in World War II. We are now witnessing the resurgence of anti-Semitism in the 21st century. It is just the same enemy, but under a different name. We also see anti-Semitism in the Bible, where God's people are persecuted. Pharaoh tried to control the Jewish population by ordering the killing of all male-born babies in the times of Moses. The Romans utterly destroyed the temple in the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. It has been estimated that half a million Jews were killed, including women and children. The Bible even predicts in the end times a large-scale war against the Jewish people where the great red dragon, Satan, will attack the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the Christ child, and two-thirds of the Jewish population will be decimated. Today, we come to another story of a vicious attempt to exterminate the whole population of Jewish people. It is still the same enemy of God's people, just under a different name. Well, who is this great enemy of God's people? The enemy is Satan himself, the mother of all anti-Semitics. Throughout human history, Satan uses different people and different names to serve his purpose, to oppose God's plan of salvation for all mankind. The title of this message is Anti-Semitism, Same Enemy, Different Name. Our text is from Esther chapter 3. Now it's a long chapter. Again, we will not read it. I will highlight certain passages. If you're at home, please open your Bible to Esther 3. Chapter 3 is a story of uh, chapter 3 of Esther is a story of another enemy of God's people Haman at this time Esther had become the queen of the Persian Empire married to the king Xerxes King Xerxes his Greek name or King Ahasuerus his Hebrew name and Esther's guardian Mordecai is in some form of government service within the Persian Empire now, my outline this morning is threefold. Number one, the prejudice, verses one through six. Number two, the plot, verses seven to eleven. Number three, the proclamation, verses twelve to fifteen. Let's start with the prejudice, the first six verses. Now, prejudice always play a role in one's hatred 
and enmity against a people of different race or color, different language, culture, and different religion. Perhaps some of us, being Chinese and Asians, have experienced some prejudice against us in our schools, workplaces, and community. You know, recently, because of COVID-19, my sister-in-law and her daughter had experienced some anti-Chinese comments from their neighbor. Chapter 3 of Esther is basically Haman's conspiracy to exterminate the whole Jewish population in the whole Persian Empire. Again, prejudice was the cause for his hatred for the Jews. Look at verse 1 and 2 with me. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamaatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him homage. After these events in chapter 2, where Esther became queen, and Mordecai foiled a plot to assassinate the king, the king appointed Haman to be second in command in his kingdom. This certainly put Haman in an official position to do harm to the Jewish people. Verse 2 says that Haman was quite upset at Mordecai. And he was angry at him for refusing to bow before him. Haman thought Mordecai, a Jew no less. Instead of blaming Mordecai, Haman decided to take his anger out on the whole Jewish race. This is very typical of prejudice, where a personal issue becomes a racial issue. Blaming a race of people based on behavior of one or few individuals. Well, who was Haman? Verse 10 describes Haman as an enemy of the Jews. Haman was an Agagite of the Amalekites. As you learned last week, Amalekites were descendants of Esau, brother of Jacob. See, Haman's prejudice can be traced back to the history of his own people. Haman was a descendant of King Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites during the times of King Saul. During the time of the Exodus, their journey to the Promised Land the Amalekites harassed, they attacked the Israelites. At one point, Moses had to order Joshua to fight them off and defend themselves. This story is recorded in Exodus chapter 17. Now, most of us probably would not remember this specific battle with the Amalekites, but I think most of us would remember the battle where Moses was up on the hill watching the battle with the rod of God in his hand. You remember when he had his arms raised, the Israelites would win. When Moses' tire arms were lower, they would lose. So at one point, Aaron and Hur had to hold up Moses' hand. This was the very battle that Israelites had with the Amalekites. Exodus 17 verse 13 says, So Joshua overcame. Some translations said, mow down the Amalekites army with the sword. So you see, the Amalekites had a long history of animosity against the Israelites. Now approximately 500 years later, during the King Saul's reign, Saul was told by God to kill all the Amalekites, including all livestock. This story is recorded in 1 Samuel 15. King Saul disobeyed and, sp and spared King Agag and some livestock. In fact, King reasoned with Samuel that these animals were saved and were supposed to use to offer sacrifices to God. God then told Saul this 
very famous line, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. Prophet Samuel had to kill King Agag himself. But apparently some of King Agag's family escaped and eventually became the Agagites. So one can imagine the hatred the Amalekites had with the Jewish people, especially the Agagites. So it is not hard to imagine that Haman grew up and was told these stories over and over again. It was ingrained into him. Now he is in a position to carry out his prejudice, his hatred against the Jews. After Haman was promoted by the king to be the prime minister, the king declared that everyone must bow before Haman. It was common ancient practice to pay public homage to someone important but not required. Some have speculated that perhaps it was Haman who himself who insisted on this honor. Haman was a proud and arrogant man, as we shall see in chapter 6. On the other hand, some speculated that Haman has such a bad reputation that no one would voluntarily pay him homage. Perhaps Haman even stole the appointment from the king from other, maybe more worthy nobles. See, Haman climbed the ladder of success by stepping on many toes. Therefore, the king had to declare it and make the people do it. Since Haman is second in person in command, basically everyone in the kingdom was required to do, except the king himself. Well, everyone did bow, except for Mordecai. Verse 3 tells us that Haman was very upset. He was even more furious when he found out that Haman was a Jew. I mean, that Mordecai was a Jew. At this point, Haman had the authority to punish and even hang Mordecai for his insubordination. Yet Haman nursed his prejudice, not just against a single Jew that wronged him, but to the whole Jewish race. This is the ugliness of prejudice and racial bias. So Haman concocted a plot, not only to hang Mordecai, but also to exterminate all of the Jewish people within the entire Persian Empire. Look at verses 5 and 6 with me. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Wow! See, what may begin as a prejudice turned into hatred and racism of the vilest form, the wholesale murder of another human race. Needless to say, we still see such racism today and genocide occur, occurring in our modern society today. The prejudice of Haman led to a plot to kill all of the Jews. What was the plot? That leads to my second point in verses 7 to 11. The plot was quite elaborate and carefully thought out. It involved casting lot, bribery, and a government sanction, looting and killing of the Jews. Let us begin with verse 7. It says, In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the pur, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Now sometime during the reign of Xerxes, the king appointed Haman to this high position of second in command. Probably several years had transpired after Mordecai's incidents. 
So Haman had years to nurse his grudge against the Jews. He probably had been planning this for years. Now the Bible said on the 12th year of the reign of King Xerxes, Haman finally hatched his plan. Now for the Middle Eastern people in those days, people would often consult the stars and omens for important undertakings. Nisan is the first month in the Persian calendar, and it was believed to be the month their gods would come and determine their fate. So the Bible says Haman and they got together. They probably referring to the astrologers and advisors. They cast lot, which is per in Persian, right? to determine a day and a month would be the best time to kill off the Jews. Haman wanted the most auspicious day from his gods to carry out his plot of destruction. And that was done before Haman went to the king with his plan. Haman wanted to be sure that his gods were with him and his plans would succeed before he went to the king. Well, the lot fell on the month of Adar, which is the twelfth month. And Haman cast out on Nisan, which is the first month. In other words, Haman had to wait 11, 11 to 12 months to carry out the plot. Now, I suspect Haman would prefer sooner. But he also believed that it was his gods that chose this day for him. But we all know, in reality, it was our Yahweh God who chose this day to give the Jews the Mordecai and Esther sufficient time to prepare and to defend themselves. Interestingly enough, Solomon writes in Proverbs 16.33, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. See, man may cast lot, but God determines the outcome. See, kings and kingdoms and people rise and fall at God's discretion and pleasure. After casting Lot, Haman went to the king. The plan was to convince the king to order a royal edict. Now remember, Persian royal edict cannot be reversed. Not even the king himself. Once a Persian royal edict is signed and sealed, it is irreversible. We have already learned that back in chapter 1. And we will again see this practice mentioned in chapter 8 of Esther. Verses 8 and 10 continue with these words. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of other people. They do not obey the king's law. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. And I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamad Atha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Again, this plot began with a racial prejudice and insinuation. It was those people. It was those certain people. No need to mention the Jewish people. Furthermore, these subversive people are scattered throughout the empire. Therefore, they are very dangerous, king, to your kingdom. It would be to the king's best interest to take care of them now. I find it very interesting. The king did not even ask who were these dangerous people before he gave Haman a blank check, essentially, to destroy them. The plot also involves half lies and half truth. Isn't it again typical of racial biases and prejudice, half lies and half truth? It was true, indeed, the Jews had a different customs from the Persians and from all the other people. 
it was probably not true that the Jewish people did not obey the king. Prophet Jeremiah even instructed the people of the exile to behave as good citizens and cooperate with their captors. Jeremiah chapter 29. Furthermore, by now these Jews have been living in Persia for a long time, ever since the exile, at least over 70 years. See, some of their fellow Jews had already returned home. These people chose not to return home when Cyrus gave them permission. They decided to stay, probably because they had already established themselves in the Persian society, probably successful in business, and became an integral part of the empire. I suspect that some were even in government services like Mordecai. It is unlikely to me to achieve all this by openly disobeying a king. Now, I would even argue that it was to the king's best interest to have this Jewish people in his empire. They were a valuable part of his kingdom. Well, the first step of this plot was to convince the king and get him on his side. Second step was to sweetening the deal by offering the king a bribe. Haman offered the king 10,000 talents of silver. Now, don't just gloss over this, okay? A talent may mean nothing to us today. A talent equals to 75 pounds. So 10,000 talents is equivalent of 375 tons of silver. Wow. However you look at it, it's lots of money. Now, put, to put it in perspective, according to a Greek historian, Herodotus, the annual income for the entire Persian Empire under King Cyrus, either Xerxes' father or grandfather, was 15,000 talents of silver. Now Haman bribed the king approximately two-thirds of the annual income. Now, do you think the king might be tempted by such a bribe? I think so. Now, there are two considerations. First, how would Haman come up with this kind of money? It is believed that the money would come from the illegal seizure of the Jewish properties and lands, similar to what the Nazis did in World War II. There was probably enough money for the king's treasury and make Haman a very rich man. The second question is, why did the king even need such large amount of money? Well, history tells us that King Xerxes earlier had waged a losing war campaign against the Greek and probably depleted the national treasury. He desperately needed the income. In fact, this Xerxes was later assassinated for, being, for losing the campaign against the Greek. We already know in chapter 2 that Mordecai foiled at least one plot against the king. So without even knowing who were the people group that Haman wanted to destroy, the king gave his full support and permission to carry out Haman's plot. Ironically, the king did not even know that his own queen is part of that certain people to be killed. This fact will play out in later chapters. Well, king Xerxes gave Haman his signet ring, meaning that Haman now has an absolute power to act in the name of the king. The king said to Haman in verse 11, Keep the money. And do with the people as you please. Now my RSV translation says this. The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Now the money here is not referring to the 10,000 talents of silver. Don't get that confused. The money has not been paid yet. And only promise. The money here refers to the wealth and the properties of the Jewish people to be seized. In other words, Haman can do whatever he wants to do with the Jewish people and their wealth and properties. Haman had a royal permission to steal. 
In summary, Haman's plot involves three steps. First step was to convince the king to plot. His second step was to offer the king a bribe. The third step was to make sure a royal edict is declared, which would be irreversible. You know, what Haman tried to do to exterminate the Jewish people was so hateful that even today, the Orthodox Jews would spit and curse whenever they hear the name Haman mentioned. You may have heard of the Feast of Purim, which, is, which the Jewish people still celebrate today. It is a feast to commemorate this very specific event in Esther. It is called Purim to name after lot casting or pur in this story. This feast was first declared in Esther chapter 9. Now each year during the Feast of Purim, the book of Esther is read in the, in the, in the synagogues. And each time Haman's name is read, the people will stomp their feet and shout, May his name be blotted out. Even today, this conspiracy of Haman is still met with disdain by the Jewish people. Well, now the plot is revealed. How would this plot be declared throughout this vast Persian Empire? How was this plot to be announced as a royal edict from the king? And this leads to my third point, the proclamation, verses 12 to 15. This proclamation can be summarized this way, starting with verse 12. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's order to the king's satrap, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various people. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. These patches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, young, old, women, and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. After Haman got the king to declare the edict, Haman wasted no time. He went to work immediately. Remember, the lot was cast in the first month, right? But on the 13th day of the same month, the month is not even over yet, Haman was already at work carrying out his evil plot to exterminate the Jewish people. The Persian Empire was the largest empire of the time. It has been estimated that within this vast empire, there were as many as 127 different languages and people groups. So it would take a long time to write and translate the royal edict into all these languages. So the king's scribes and secretaries, they went to work immediately. In the meantime, Haman used this edict to stir up anti-Semitism throughout the whole empire. The edict was written in people's own languages, so everyone knew the edict. Now the people were sanctioned. They had permission to kill. They were licensed to kill, if you will, on the 13th day of the 12th month. They can destroy, annihilate, kill the Jews, young, old, women, and children. Furthermore, they can loot and plunder all their goods and property. This royal edict was to carry out throughout the entire empire and not just in the capital city of Susa. The edict to be delivered throughout the vast empire. Verse 15a says, 
the couriers went out spur on by the king's command and the edict was issued in a citadel or the capital Susa. Now Bible scholars and historians have reported that the Persian had a very effective postal system to ensure rapid communication within the empire. I read that they have something similar to the Pony Express in the days of the American West. They had way stations with fresh horses and riders to ensure maximum speed. And these stations were, 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 were scattered approximately a day's ride apart. So it was an ancient Tony Express, Pony Express, you might say. It was in fact estimated that within two or three days, the furthest extent of the empire can be reached. Now while all these were happening, we see wicked Haman and King Xerxes were drinking at the capital with no apparent thought of the genocide and the tremendous injustice that is about to happen. In fact, this chapter ends with these tragic words. Verse 15. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Sosa was bewildered. The capital city was puzzled over such miscarriage of justice. I suspect those Gentiles and Jews wonder why was such dramatic change in government policy? Why were the Jews targeted as enemies of the state? But the callous and the apathetic perpetrators were enjoying themselves in the pleasure of intoxicating alcohol. Such apathy, callousness, callousness are often part of the racial prejudice and bias against people of different color, different race, custom, and belief. The great enemy of God's people, Satan, may have his two persons doing his bidding at this time, Haman and King Xerxes. But you know what? God also has his two persons, Mordecai and Queen Esther. And you have to stay tuned for the rest of the story. Let me summarize this message. Anti-Semitism. Same enemy, different name. As I said, anti-Semitism is not new at all. It has happened throughout human history. And it is still happening today. It is still the same enemy, just under different names. Anti-Semitism is ugly and should not be tolerated. Now today in our polarized society, people are protesting against one another. Everyone seems to be anti-something, isn't it? We are anti-everything. We're anti-war, anti-police, anti-establishment, anti-racism, anti-gay, anti-Christian, anti-Muslim, anti-Semitic, anti-white, anti-black, anti-abortion, anti-right, anti-left. And this list goes on and on. Well, let me suggest, brothers and sisters, three ways of application not just against anti-Semitism, but against all racial biases, all prejudices and injustice, okay? Number one, we must recognize and appreciate all human beings are created in the image of God. We must recognize and appreciate all human beings are created in the image of God. You see, our human worth is not in our skin color, our race, culture, or religion, or one's position in life, our human worth rests in the fact that we are in the image of God, created equal with inherent equal dignity and worth. We must not elevate one ethnicity above another. After fall of mankind, we have lost its image of God or, or being the image bearer of God. So we are now capable of hate. We are capable of killing and murder. 
But praise God, praise the Lord, Jesus Christ has redeemed us. He died on the cross for our sins and gave us a new life. We are now once again redeemed image bearer of God. We are to reflect the character of God, reflect his goodness, his compassion, his mercy, his justice and forgiveness, and so on. Number two, recognize and confess our own prejudices and biases. As fallen human beings, we all are prejudiced against those who are different from us. We're all bigots to some and to different degrees, though the object of our bigotry may be different. Some are biased based on religion. Some may be based on skin color and national origin. Some may be appearance and clothing that one wears. Some are biased towards someone speak with a different accent. Whatever our biases are, brothers and sisters, admit them and confess them to the Lord. Third, recognize and obey our call to be peacemakers and what I call reconcilers. We are called to be peacemakers and not peace breakers and not trouble makers. Jesus Christ says in Matthew 5 9, Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall call the children of God. Apostle Paul writes that we all have been given the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the world to God. See, the Bible says God does not wish anyone to perish, but everyone to have eternal life. See, Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world, all races, all sin colors. We cannot fulfill the great commission to make disciples of all nations and all tongues unless we also love the people of all races, people that are different from us. When I was young, we used to sing this children's song, Jesus Loves the Little Children. Maybe some know this song. This song is probably not considered politically correct nowadays, but it has a profound truth. Jesus loves little children, all the children of the world, red, brown, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. The second verse says Jesus died for all the children of the world. The third verse goes on to say that Jesus rose for all the children of the world. The truth that Jesus loves, the truth that Jesus died and rose for all the children of the world should be enough to put an end to racial prejudice and bias. Let me end this with Apostle Paul's word in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here, and this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Brothers and sisters, let's go out as ambassadors for Christ with the message of reconciliation, to be peacemakers, to love all the children of the world, red, brown, yellow, black, and white. It's not an easy task, but may God help us. Would you bow with me and pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Lord, we confess that we fall short of your command to love all people and all nations. All of us uh, do have prejudice and bias within us. Forgive us, Father. Lord, give us courage and boldness now, Lord. Go out to be peacemakers, to be your ambassadors, reconciling this troubled world to you so they may see your love and mercy and compassion. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.